of uh, speaking. I am a bit of a foreigner here and feel a bit out of place. Uh, we do the venturing, you people provide the capital and that's how the venture capital industry ever came. When I was asked to contribute to this uh, conference, I was feeling that I am feeling as much fish out of water as you might feel uh, during this set session. Uh, but what I wanted to do in the next half an hour is to do something which uh, I consider very complex. Uh, try to point out those aspects of India which we know but we don't know that we know and assemble them into a garland of things that you know but don't know that you know and give a different picture of India. And I'm doing this uh, because I've been traveling for many years for business in to many countries. And of course, like any curious traveler, I'm interested in the history, the economics, the politics of that country, but not in depth because I have come there to do a deal, I've come there to sell something, buy something. And so I've got all these books at home about almost every country I've visited, the tourist view, the economic view, the political view. But what I'm really looking for is a horizontal section, which gives me enough feel for each of these and helps me to get to what I call the 2%. What do I mean by 2%? When you go to another country or you meet a different bunch of people, the fact that they are more or less like you matters far less than to find out in what way they are not like you. For example, your DNA, 98% of your DNA resembles a chimpanzee. It doesn't matter. If I call you approximately a bunch of chimpanzees sitting in the room, I think you will rightly feel offended. It's the difference lies in that 2%. And so we have this way of simplifying a complex world, not only in the financial industry, but in every industry, where we say that's more or less it. And then we sometimes tend to forget that it's the last 1%, 2% that makes a difference. And therefore, I'm going to focus on the last 1% or 2%. I think I recognize that most of you are Indian nationals and talk to Indian nationals about India and its distinctiveness is a real challenge. This works well with foreigners because they don't know much. But I assure you only one thing. I'm not going to run through all the slides. But I have used these slides and talked to many audiences. And what has given me a good high is not that you walked away from this knowing how to be a better LP or GP or investor or an analyst. But people have walked away saying, you know, I didn't think of it that way. And if the needle can shift a few millimeters, in your industry it's worth a billion. We know that... Uh, the problems and issues that India is facing are not by any means unique. You go anywhere in the world, you'll find exactly the same. If the BJP can't agree with the Congress, the Republicans can't agree with the Democrats. China's leaders are accepting that their own economy is unstable. You can go to Brazil, you can go to Africa, you'll find similar sort of situations. We know that Putin is not the solution for Russia. Reflecting on the fact that Prime Minister Manmohan Singh had one or two ministers resign in Brazil, they had seven ministers resign on similar charges. And when I used to work in Unilever, I often used to wonder about the infatuation in Unilever with Brazil and going back to the 70s until the bubble burst one fine day, the Latin American bubble. They always had a very dim view of India. So somehow, it has always struck me that India never looks sexy. There's a short aberrant period of about four years between 2003 and 2008. I have selected one or two aspects, hopefully reasonably researched thesis, because I'm not a sociologist, I'm not an economist, I'm not a culture vulture. But from a businessman's perspective, I put these together. And the first thing I would like to do is to show you how India is very unique, one aspect of it only, in its political evolution. Now what you're seeing on this chart is the way um, every other country has developed. And I'll tell you why I'm calling it the Benjamin Button effect. The top part shows you the classical sequence in which every other country in the world has developed. They were, there was no democracy, everybody was a farmer, think back 300 years, and then the industrial revolution spurred entrepreneurship, people could make lots of money in a very short time, that happened only in the 1800s. Society started to break down, a common person could sit with a rich person, and so capitalism unleashed a big change, and that was followed by constitutional liberalism, rules of assets and who the property belongs to. And Democracy, which I'm defining as full franchise democracy, is a very, very recent phenomenon in most countries. And just to tell you how recent it is, we tend to forget. I've taken giving everybody a vote as a simple measure of democracy, not a perfect one. Norway gave women votes in 1913. UK gave in 1928. France, women could not vote till 1944. Italy gave the vote to women in 1945. India gave it in 1947 with independence. Greece gave it later in 1952. And believe it or not, the world's most transparent country, Switzerland, gave it in 1971. In 1970, when I began my career, Swiss women could not vote. So we don't understand the power of what has happened. Whether your op opinion is good or bad is besides the point. I'm make, merely making the statement of fact. 
So you have an unclassical sequence, and the consequence of the unclassical sequence is that you are sitting in a rather unique position. What you have on the x-axis is a sequence in which things happen, political evolution, and you can see that India sits in the unclassical end, and what you have on the y-axis is the nature of capitalism, whether you have democratic capitalism, autocratic capitalism, or the other multiple forms of capitalism that people talk about today. And I don't have to describe this chart in any detail to you. I have added South Africa and Israel as possible companions of India in that box but we are almost solo there. So the first thing I want you to note, good or bad you can decide, is there is no other country which has followed that kind of political evolution. The second aspect, but we all know, and this doesn't require any explanation to you, that in economic evolution also, we had a very unusual path, that we missed the whole infrastructure, the whole uh, manufacturing industry and went straight into service industry. I'm not going to spend time explaining this. We also know, and particularly your community knows this very well, that we are a consumption society which compares in its consumption expenditure to GDP very well. And also we know, and all of you are better purveyors of this information than I, that in many, many commodities, the per capita consumption of India is so way below what other countries have achieved, that the headroom for growth looks infinite. Now, these are all well known to you and I need not explain them. But what we also see concurrently is a very unusual pathway and evolution of the Indian multinational corporation. If I might just draw your attention for a moment to the sequence in which business organizations have evolved. If you're a business historian, you'll find these five or six phases. Initially, there was farming and trading and that moved to the first kind of industrial organizations 200 years ago. Then medium to large scale industrial organizations started to develop from little small sweatshops until they had multi-business conglomerates. And then we had multi-business, multi-geography conglomerates, people like Unilever, people like Procter & Gamble, GE, and so on and so forth. But a very interesting phenomenon is that while globalized corporations, read Procter & Gamble, Unilever, have dissected all their supply chain and marketing activities and see the world as one, a new animal is emerging. And that's listed under seven. The multi-business, multi-geography conglomerates of emerging market origin. This just wasn't there on the scene 10 years ago, 15 years ago. In its elemental form, it appeared when Japan started to consolidate after the war. And then you had Korean multinationals. And this has been spurred by the factors that we all know. That we've had the collapse of communism, the Uruguay round, uh, rapid advances, uh, advances in communication and computing. So we all know the reasons why this has happened. But a point I want you to recognize and think about, again you know it, I'm not telling you what you don't know, is that the EMNE -E is a new animal that's on the prowl. A Tata, a Tata Steel, a Tata Motors, uh, Aditya Birla Hindalko, a multinational coming from an emerging market because the rules of the game of an emerging multinational are vastly different from well-established ones. So if you put them together, you see the definition of what academics have called for the first time, the world is seeing up-market FDI. So far, FDI automatically meant from a rich country to the poor country. So what's the big deal? American money coming to India, European money coming to China. But for the first time, Indian money and Chinese money is going out. And in some odd years, in excess of the money, it attracts from there. So this new animal called up-market FDI has come in. And if I might use it without intending to be pejorative, the so-called down-market has become FII and up market is becoming FDI. And these are at an infant stage. We expect them to behave like the multinationals you know, but they are at an infant stage because as you can imagine, the EMNEs are at various stages of their development. Even Tata I would recognize, I would consider as an infant EMN. People come and say, oh, you become a global corporation, you get 65% of your revenue from outside India and what are your globalizing plans and this and that. And it's very tempting to make very profound statements. Once in a while we do fall into the trap. But really, there is no profound statement to be made. We are pilgrims on this journey trying to learn. So it is like what happens when your son suddenly becomes a six-footer. He's only 14 years old. He looks fully developed to an outsider. But to you, he's a little boy. And you've got this dichotomy of trying to deal with a country which has spent its first 40 years of independence saying capitalism is bad and money is bad has spent the last 15 years figuring out how good or how bad money is. And at this equivalent stage in his development, others were killing each other on the fields. It's still unknown to anybody's predictions, unitary, run as one country, and is a lone shining example of democratic capitalism anywhere in the world. However, 
it's got lot of imperfections because it's an i call india an adolescent country and i call it a benjamin button country because on the one hand people will very proudly say we are 4000 year civilization and we invented zero and bhaskaracharya and all this stuff which is also true so how can a 4000 year old entity look like a young adolescent but we are both and that what benjamin button was for those of you who have seen that film i want to touch upon the cultural aspect because this is a very unusual and i will conclude with saying what are the implications because as i went around the world in trying to do business for unilever or tata it is the behavior of people i was dealing with that gave me more insight into their pronouncements foreigners come to india they go to delhi they talk to people in planning commission finance ministry and they come away very impressed with the sheer articulation of those guys they are damn intelligent guys they can't get it done and they can't recognize the difference between these two not because they are stupid by the way you can put a lot of very intelligent people into room and get complete lack of action that's possible and uh, we've got evidences of it everywhere in large organizations but let me touch upon the cultural aspect for a moment and i'm going to touch only on one or two aspects uh, our attitude to forming opinion and consensus uh, unlike the anglo-saxon tradition which is developed on the greek philosophical tradition it is not in a straight line including you people including everybody we tend to believe that the world has very little clarity ambiguity is a natural force in the world and there are thin slivers of clarity on either end which is exactly the opposite of the way a westerner might look at it in terms of contacts and networking what is happening outside there to those who are not listening to my scintillating speech is networking you know there are you see on the right hand side cube all sorts of connections being very much like in a cell phone uh, network and they are not sort of straight networks so everybody in india is everybody's cousins brother in laws cousin in laws daughter in laws husband there is nobody who is more than five distances away from you. the whole of delhi works on that basis in delhi it matters whom you know and where you live and the whole place works on that basis our attitude to punctuality i need not describe we have a very approximate sense of time and this is hugely irritating to people who come from outside including my countrymen who have lived outside for long including myself by the way because i have worked in an anglo dutch company for 30 years and i have not been untouched by that so people say come to my house when next week that's a lot of time you know which day tuesday wednesday which day tuesday what time 9ish when are you supposed to turn up for dinner and don't be surprised if you turn up at 9 if your host is having a shower or is just coming back from office you know the excuse is very clear traffic now um, our attitude to a queue which is the last one on the right is very interesting i think a british child is born standing in a queue right it comes out of his mother's womb and immediately is put in a queue and throughout his life he thinks of it as the order is the way to progress we are different so this manifests itself in many interesting ways you look at the musical tradition in india versus the west okay uh I'm not going to play you any music but um, in a western orchestra the whole script is written in advance who is in charge is clear it's the director there is no improvisation every single minute every single note has been practiced in orchestra and then you see the ensemble that you get in a chamber music or in a uh, indian music is exactly the opposite it's all about improvisation and the delight that the artist will take in improvising with each other delights the audience who will break into periodic applause so the idea that creativity is more important than order is deep in our genes and music is one way the idea that everything doesn't have to be planned is deep in your genes even if you're an indian living in america by the way because when my cousins come from there or my friends come from there periodically in the way they behave you can see that the gene hasn't gone away but the outward appurtenance has probably changed and the tongue is probably slightly accented so the idea that chaos is not all bad is deeply in, in 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 inside your genes the fact that you can accept all sorts of uh, changes without noticing it i don't know if i should have the time to play this have you heard of this guy called miang chang he's a chinese he's from hubei province he came three generations ago he looks completely chinese to you and uh, he is chinese but he is born and raised here he speaks hindi like a jharkhandi and he sings hindi music and takes part in all the uh, shows that go on on television if you had an indian living in poland singing polish music um, the economic times would certainly carry him on the front page every day for about a year till he became a national hero so it's very unusual but many people in india don't even know it and if they met him they might think he's from india we in our culture we just absorb these things so without going more and more into these examples i want to say so what you told us one or two things about politics economics 
and culture. So bloody what? Well, how does it matter to me and my life? And I've listed out 11 ways in which you see the behavior of Indians when it comes to policy and action, which is very, very different. And unless the investor or the businessman who's come to do business recognizes these unique features, which reflect an apparently different behavior, he will not, if he doesn't pick up the 2% and he looks at the 98%, he's almost certainly going to get a wrong impression. I've got 11 of them here, but let me take a few of them, which may be a bit interesting. Can you name me any community in the world uh, can you name me any country in the world? They will think in their language and act in their language. A Japanese fellow, you can see, is thinking in Japanese and will act like a Japanese. So also Chinese. The Indian manager, PLU, people like us, are the only species in the world who think in English but act in Indian. Most of us don't read a vernacular paper. Most of us don't think in vernacular. We read English textbooks written by American academics or somebody else. But when we have to take action, we actually act in the Indian metaphor. It reflects in the way people get promoted. Even people who return from Harvard and MIT who will talk about meritocracy, they say, well, he's a bit older, so, you know, promote him first. Or uh, we must give weight to the fact he's got only five years to retire. These sorts of ideas, um, in some unfortunate cases, he may even say that he belongs to that community and therefore that becomes important. So related party transactions and in sometimes in Indian business can be very irritating. After all, he's my cousin. After all, it's my son-in-law because somehow you can't make this distinction. The second thing is Indians rely a lot on the exercise of soft power, right? We give the impression we are talking about hard power, but our influence globally throughout our history has been on soft power. Um, I remember the year I was finishing my studies ready for my career, 1966, when uh, three major things happened. And in my young tender mind, sitting in some hostel at IIT Kharagpur, I was very uh, uh, thoughtful about this. Um, the first was that uh, the late Ravi Shankar burst into the international scene, merely because he taught four long-haired fellows how to play the sitar. Merely because. And the rest of the story we know. It's the very same year when another long-haired yoga expert called BKS Ayanga went to California and he taught yoga to some very wealthy Hollywood types. And now yoga is an American word, which India has rediscovered. It's also the same year I remember when we had a secretary general from Burma called Uthan and he called uh, invited M.S. Subalakshmi to come and sing in the United Nations and the very mellifluous voice of Subalakshmi in the United Nations brought Carnatic music into a global forum. It became global and today if you go to Chennai during the music festival time you can see how internationalized you can go to the YouTube and buy for two dollars a ticket and listen to whole Kacheri. Many such things have happened, history, geography, culture, religion. I want to show you one video to break all the monotony of having to listen to my prattle, which I would request them to play for you as to how far Bollywood has gone. Can you play this? This is an ice skating championship, by the way, in the United States. US national dance champions. Please welcome Meryl Davis and Charlie White. So here are the ice dancing champions winning their second U.S. championship in a row and beating Melbourne and Augusto for the first time in their career. Merrill Davis and Charlie White performing their original dance to Indian folk music. <laughs> gives you a little break. I don't know how many of you have seen that, but I would hope LPs and GPs and other kinds of Ps that you have and investors in India would look at India a bit like that as a melange and not expect ice skating to be like ice skating, not expect uh, filmy dance music, but look at the melange. And that requires the ability 
which i think is sorely lacking in the business world industrial world including your world i am trained because of my student of physics or engineering like many of you when i see an object i say what is in that object and the reductionist principle of saying oh that's comprised of molecules atoms electrons positrons neutrinos quarks and science doesn't know what's beyond a quark the reduction is principle if you are a right brain person you'll say i see that object but what is that object a part of what is the context in which that object is set and i don't believe anybody is going to get any mileage out of investing in india doing business in india unless they see what is this a part of i think the great genius of unilever which i had the privilege of serving for 30 years was unilever was endowed with a bunch of people i have gone through the history of this who saw what is hindustan lever or lever brothers that was called a part of in my global firmament and stuck it out they didn't say let's walk away as ibm did and that's the difference between a purely anglo saxon rational left brain view of the world and sometimes as a non financial industries person i feel if only the financial industry people use their right brain a wee bit don't put it into sleep mode you'll get a very different perspective of this country and its uh, potential so we are able to live with the uh, uh, coexistence of uh, uh, chaos and technology simultaneously people find this absolutely bewildering what you are seeing here are not just a cycle by the way that's the first thumba equatorial launch station in 1962 it the launch station was set up in a coconut plantation in kerala and he is carrying the rocket on the back of his bicycle it's not just some toy and the one you see on the right is the apple which is india's first experimental geo communication satellite is going on the ubiquitous bullock cart uh, this is something anybody who's grown up in india takes for granted we are sitting in the city of the dabawalas i don't need to tell you about the dabawalas six sigma performance without any mbas <laughs> reducing the divorce rate in india 200000 meals as delivered from the right wife to the right husband and he doesn't know how he does it so the fact that you can't quite answer it doesn't mean that you don't know and the fact that you can answer it doesn't mean that you know and this is the rewiring we've just finished the kumbh mela last yesterday at lunch i was discussing with some of my colleagues and people were saying how many people come to the kumbh mela compared to and so i got a statistic down and maybe interesting for you to see this uh, 100 million pilgrims i said this to a swiss guy he said 100 million he i mean you know he can't even get the number into his head the wedding of prince williams and catherine since it's a big event in the uk for some strange reason attracted 1 million people the annual hajj pilgrimage gets 3 million people the funeral procession of ayrton senna the brazilian race who was a hero in sao paulo 1994 when he died was 3 million people don't understand 100 million the number doesn't exist and like india has successfully confused the world with crores we are now moving into arab and even indians don't know what's an arab it's a uh, 100 crores is an arab so very soon they'll mix us up with middle eastern politics as a result of all these uh, ability to deal with chaos and order at the same time indians can carry on with business as though no great crisis has happened and all of us are privy to this so i won't i'm going to skip that slide in the interest of time we got 1.2 billion phd's and my definition of a phd is a poor hungry driven fellow at the end of the day if you can assess the human capital through anecdotal evidences you get far better insight into a company or a country than out of all the economic data because all the economic data is suspect anyway if you got two economists you'll have three opinions and four sets of data and the fifth one, sixth and seventh will be debating which of them is right so what's the use of all that data so i'm not totally disrespectful of statistics which is very left brained activity but i am arguing that you do need a little more of the uh, other brain to be used god has given us two brains for a reason and i hope somebody in this financial services industry the industrial world to which i belong have become a great advocate of this help us to use our right brain a bit through these little examples that i'm using there's a big hullabaloo about retail trade it's the biggest nonsense <laughs> in my opinion at least about fdi and retail and everybody's waiting in the queue waiting for the big miracle to happen india the 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 advocates say that this is the biggest revolution in india after 1857 or some such uh, quit india movement and there's another bunch of guys saying they're going to kill off everybody and i was in washington recently and there was some discussion and people were very aggressive and i said can you tell me any other country in the world where the number of retail outlets per thousand population has increased in the last 30 years? and they said oh we we'll have to check that I said there's only one country, India, and please go back and think as to why that's happened. Not a single country, not Thailand, not Sri Lanka, not Pakistan, only India. 
But it's another example of the 2% rather than the 98%. We all know individual liberty is far more important than uh, economic growth. So people think that if a state has good economic performance, that government gets re-elected and bingo, you find the opposite. Tamil Nadu has perfected this. It's the one actor or the other actor, one with the dark glasses or one without the dark glasses. It depends whether the sun is out for the five years or the moon is out for the next five years. And this is, it's almost like a private arrangement, you know, you take five, I take five. Um, but we all know that if you don't give people individual liberty, uh, it doesn't work for us. Uh, you just finished the elections in Tripura. Tripura, on the other side of Bangladesh, in case you don't know, 93% voter turnout. These are not people who went to MIT and Boston. These are simple people who stood in the sun to exercise their vote. 93%. You know, the other day I was talking, not the other day, last year or year, year before, about transparency, corruption and so on. And I said, who is the most corrupt nation in the world? So I said, Switzerland. There was a deathly silence. And people said, have you lost your head? They win everything under Transparency International. I said, your whole country and your whole economy, in my perception, takes the world's most toxic money and converts it into white money. We call it Hawala in India. And it's an offense that can be punished. You guys have made a virtue out of it. Now, it depends on how you look at it. I'm not going to argue that I'm right and you're wrong. But the same thing looked at in a different way, you get a very different perception. This is another statement I made there, that we elect three million legislators every five years. And... No other country does it. Switzerland said that's half our population and that's only the number of legislators we have, including the Panchayati Raj people. So there's a lot of imperfection mixed up with perfection. And uh, this characterizes the way, this is a very innovative, our, we, we make a virtue or a other thing out of Jugad. If somebody had to cut onions, so he used his crash helmet, helped him to keep the onion fumes away from his eyes. Anyway, let me close here. I said I would speak for just half an hour and I hope I have put together a bunch of facts and pictures to at least persuade you that you cannot look at India on the basis of 98%. If you do not focus on the 2%, whether you're LP, GP, soap maker, car maker, uh, anything. And therefore, things in India work in a particular way. The rest of the world may or may not be interested. That's unfortunate, but that's a reality. But if you take a 20-year view, and I heard a discussion just before I came on among some panelists about taking a long-term view, if that word exists, uh, then uh, I think the case to me is incredibly compelling. I would trust my money with a system that has self-correction, with a system that has buying power, with a system that has nowhere to go but up, but occasionally it will go through its dips. And therefore, uh, whether I sell India or not, I believe there is no market like India and I worked in other places. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Now, can we get a question? You have left them stunned, sir, completely. Yes, there is a question there, yes. Could you take the mic across there, please? Sir, you spoke about, uh, you know, us being uh, different on the socio, on the economic side. But do you think, uh, as, as Indians, we are on ethics, are we similar, different to other country, to, you know, other civilizations or other countries? Is there something particular for us in terms of ethics which is different? I think so. But what you consider uh, ethics in one kind of uh, social context may not be the way the other guy sees it. For example, I don't mind saying this, I'm very proud of it. My father, like many of you's fathers or grandfather, left a small village in Tamil Nadu and came away under very difficult circumstances, economic circumstances, back in the 20s to earn a living in a large city. That allows me to stand and talk to you guys and I'm sure your father or grandfather also might have had a similar background. It was very common that the first son of the village, not of the family, got to Calcutta. In those days, he went to Calcutta or Delhi. He would then bring the other cousins. And many of us have been the beneficiaries of this. Had my father's elder brother not given him a lifeline, he wouldn't have gone and then they gave the next brother a life. So the family and helping the family is considered to be normal. Uh, this lands itself into other situations where when you run a modern corporation, the line between uh, the company's money and your money, your family and yours, they cannot see it different or they don't want to see it. And I ask the question when it comes to ethics, that is this also an evolutionary process? I don't think Indians are vile and venal, that their DNA has a particular strand missing and that God has made a most corrupt bunch of guys. They're all bloody corrupt. All human beings have the same amount of corruption. Its manifestation is different. I gave you the example of Switzerland. To me, they're the most corrupt nation in the world. I mean, organized hawala. Here you chase Dawood Ibrahim around with some uh, letter or whatever it's called. So, you look at the United States. Just 110 years ago, 
I say just because uh, 110 is not such a long. President Teddy Roosevelt said, I see no future for this country. I see no hope for this country. There's so much corruption. You go and see the film Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln is described as a pure man who had to deal all sorts of impure means to save the confederation. In Britain, you could get a question asked in parliament for a sum of five pounds in 1885. Five pounds looks very little now, but I suppose it must have been a fair amount of money. As late as 1973, Britain's parliament appointed a commission of inquiry into how to bring more probity amongst parliamentary. I said, just take out Britain, put India and write the same report, you'll probably be valid. So I am really of the view that I am not very proud of our record of corruption and so on. But the lens through which people are looking at it and the historical evolutionary aspect cause me to be optimistic, to say that this will also pass, but it will not vanish. It will transform itself. If you want to be in America, a few big crooks dominate the place <laughs> and a lot of petty crooks don't. We have removed petty corruption. You could get a gas cylinder now without any bribery. Today you can get a milk card without bribery. Today you can get a telephone without bribery. Actually, they'll bribe you to get a telephone. It wasn't so 20 years ago. So. In a period of time, corruption is like a, like a pigment which is sort of moving across and it will change its nature and shape. Um, that's my answer. I would certainly not accept that our DNA is deficient in one strand. Uh, <clears throat> so that was one of the most engaging presentations I've heard. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering, you've described the Indian psyche as operating essentially on the, right, on the right side. And you have a bunch of Indian multinational corporations, you can call them multinational corporations now, that are looking to dominate the world and work in economies and societies that operate on the left side. Can you tell us a little about your experience with the Tata Group on how the Tatas have managed to work in an environment that's essentially right-led to dominate or to get into the left field? I think that's a super question. I'm glad you asked it because I probably am a not unique, but uh, uh, I've been privileged. 31 years I worked in an Anglo-Dutch company, which is, by the way, it's not that one brain or the other works, you know, your mind keeps moving, but one is more dominant than the other. And I wouldn't have become vice chairman, I wouldn't have survived 31 years if I hadn't become a bit Anglo-Dutch. And one of the biggest changes that happened to me when I joined Tata's, <laughs> Tata's had a different, the swing was on a different pivot uh, in terms of the left brain, right brain. And it took me a lot of adjustment in the first two years to rewire my brain to start to see this. I won't, in the interest of time, I will not go into specific instances, though I'd be very happy to sit and have a cup of coffee with you sometime and tell you. But there was a big difference. And you said, what is the experience of Tata's? That's precisely the experience we've had in Tata's. When we took over a, a company in the UK, for example, the guys in the UK we took over said, we are used to somebody signing the check, coming and removing the first two layers, putting their own people and putting their own SAP system, their own HR systems, financial systems. When are you guys going to do it? And Tata people said, no, no, we are not going to do that. We didn't buy you to convert you to look like us. We want to see what are your strengths and how we can build on you. And they left them completely confused. And I call the Western MNC way of mergers and acquisitions as the conqueror mode. I paid, I have conquered, everything will run like my city and I'll recreate that. The Indian way, at least the Tata way I can say, is to go as a collaborator mode. I happen to have signed a check for you, but you surely know some things very well compared to me. Can you and I do something different and go at a 45 degree? It's exactly from the time Alexander came to this country, from the time various invasions happened, we never rejected a single one. I have to tell people in Europe, Christianity is older in India than in your country. Because directly with an SMS, St. Thomas came from Jesus Christ's table, straight to Kerala, right? He came on the wings of an aeroplane long before you fellows knew what's Christianity. Judaism came here even before him. So what are you talking about? To talk of these as foreign. So I looked at Indian cuisine and Western cuisine just to close with a metaphorical example rather than a philological example. Very often if you see Western cuisine, vegetables are bought and they are mashed. So you get mashed potato soup, mashed. They change its form, right? You only know it's potato or broccoli because it says so on the menu. Otherwise, you can't see particles. Look at Indian cuisine. Mixed vegetable curry. So you'll get chunks of different vegetables holding together in a sauce, what we call a curry. This is Indian culture. Parsis can be Parsis, Jains can be Jains, Muslims can be Muslims, all held together in a common sauce, which is very difficult to describe. And so, I find the same thing happening in the business world, that your ability to deal with apparent ambiguity in different parts. Look what happened when Garibaldi united Italy back in 1865. There were only 2% of the population of the then Italy could understand the same language. He said, this is out, here's the new Italian and everybody will jolly well learn this. What happened in Israel was formed. All of you will learn Hebrew and speak the same. For a moment, Pandit Nehru thought of doing the same thing until the Tamils went on the rampage and said it's impossible to learn this crazy language called Hindi. And what has happened subsequently, Amitabh Bachchan, Dilip Kumar and all these people through the Hindi movies now 
even in madurai they speak hindi so we have a different way of assimilation and that happens in business thank you you hari wanted to say something so i think one final question there yeah you know i take your point on the body right brain and as you said it works both work together the question was how does it, how do you create this in professionals as you as you you know go up and become what you are like uh, one uh, consistent complaint we keep hearing about particularly in the iit education is it is so left brain that there is insufficient broad basing of the whole thing so uh, can you see, can you, have you seen other economies other countries where a more broad based approach to this like the liberal arts education in the us for example produce such results you know that's a very left brain question though and uh, how do we really look at this as something that we need to bring about in a more formal way such that what we get can be more relaxed? no if, if i i don't have a simple answer i think this is you know the, the whole point about the left brain right brain neuroscience is only 40 50 years old the i think the guy who got the nobel prize for discovering these two brains it's only 40 50 years old. and our understanding of this is very very limited but i have been very uh, interested uh, if you want to read called a whole new mind uh, pinker something steven pinker steven pinker's book a whole new mind explains this roger martin from rotman school has written a very fine book on this and uh, i don't think i can figure it out but what i am saying more important is we have it naturally you don't have to create it indians automatically work with the left and the right brain the right brain has come because of their dna and their left brain has come because of their anglo education that's what i meant when i said we think in english and act in indian we sometimes scoff at it and say this is bad and if you can at least stop scoffing at it i think there is a value that we've got these two brains one is genetically inherited and one is linguistically inherited thanks to macaulay then i think we are sitting on an asset which is unparalleled chinese don't have it japanese don't have it nobody in the world has it and yet we don't recognize it and i'm merely trying to point out that it is thanks a lot i i i i so I just before your... you wind up i think mr parik our uh, earlier keynote speaker has a question to ask of you too Uh, right there uh, said uh, indians are different in some sense but if you look at the indians settled in america and their consumption pattern i would say indians makes the best america you know they they behave the same way you know there is no difference in their consumption pattern they are as consumption oriented and everything else so isn't this just a matter of environment are bringing the level it's not an american culture it's an industrial culture once india becomes industrialized we will all behave the same and i was dealing with a different context i automatically did it i never even thought of all these things when i come back and you look at your own nri cousins when they come back uh, they will attend your weddings and behave many of them will behave very very naturally indian so i think this ability of indians to adapt i mean uh, my my thesis is much longer than 20 minutes but you make a very valid point i think it's is is an enormous strength which is undervalued and not recognized that's you you adduce my point and it could change of course it will change it has to change otherwise we are nuts but let's use the asset that we have so uh, you had them stunned for a while but uh, a lot of questions pouring in actually there's one final question uh, channi jafri who is the business director of bc circle has a question for you uh, just wanted to thank you very much for this fantastic presentation and i ask you this in my personal capacity so please do not hold bc circle responsible for this question i just wanted to ask you um uh, amartya sen recently said 48% of the people in india don't have access to even toilets and um, we rank even lower than bangladesh in human development index and so the growth seems to be even projected otherwise seems very lopsided and it's actually ex- excluding people who need it the most so great respect for all the foreign invasions that we seem to do in 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 the boardrooms but uh, is it really reaching out to the lowest denomination and where do you see india moving in on on that on that trajectory thank you know you. i mean I, i'm neither mad enough nor are you facile enough to argue that it's an acceptable situation that 48% or 47% if i'm a good bureaucrat i would even argue that it used to be uh, 56% it's come down to 48% and we're on the right path i don't have the numbers i'm not arguing um, i just want to say this think think back in history um, if you were living in london in dickensian time 1820 london was a cesspool of disease dirt squalor early industrialization would you ever think this will be the world's greatest financial center you won't you would never think you're in the middle of a great transformation because the transformation cycle like the conductive cycle in economics is a 40 50 60 year cycle i am very ashamed that we don't have water or i am not for a moment complacent about it um, but it's a long cycle and i think these things i feel confident will get sorted out because i think we are in the middle of an enormous revolution which mankind has never seen no other country other than china has lifted 300 million people out 
whatever you criticize the government for. But the fact of the matter is, only two nations have done this, 300, 400 million people. China has done it in a different way. But China's culture and origins are very different from India. China has been harshly ruled, it's been centrally ruled for 4,000 years. It's a unitary culture. They did the mashed potato stuff, everybody is a Han Chinese there. They're trying to do it to the Tibetans. Now that's good luck. If it works for them, it works for them. You can't do this in India. You can't make a Tamil into a Punjabi. The only way is to get your daughter married to one of the other ones and then you'll produce a product which... So India is different. You have to live to your genius. And these things, I'm afraid, will take their own course. We'll solve them in our own inscrutable ways. But I don't lose hope at all. I feel very confident. But don't expect in five years that we'll all have toilets for him. It's good that Professor Amartya Sen is making a noise. It's good that we have a civil society. It's good that we have all these people speaking up. I'm really delighted, not about the individual, Arvind Kedriwal or Anna Hazare or Vinod Rai or all these great guys, but it shows a vibrant society and a government that is struggling to respond. You can criticize the government. That's your privilege as a citizen. If you're in the politics of it, you can take a shot at it. But by God, it's showing huge change to me. And I'll be very proud if I have my grandson would ever call me back from the heavens or the hell, wherever I may be. Because this will be a very different country. A country which we will all be proud of. That's my opinion.